Hello and welcome to Happy Horror Time Podcast. My name is Matt Emmert. And I'm Tim Murdoch. Our guest today is anything but a nightmare. He's actually a dream warrior, having starred as lovable tough guy Roland Kincaid in not one, but two Nightmare on Elm Street films. Part three, <laughs> Dream Warriors, and part four, The Dream Master. Hey. Welcome to the podcast, Ken Sagos. Did I pronounce that right? Sagos, what you say matters, but what can say goes. Ken, Ken, oh, I love that. Say goes. Say goes. Oh, my God. And that is great. Hi, Ken. How are you today? I'm doing all right. And first, let me say happy Mother's Day to your mothers and to all the women in your life that are mothers. Not motherfuckers, but mothers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Darlene will love it. Yes, my mom will love that, too. She's a mother, not a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, um, Ken, we love taking it back to beginning. And when we were doing research on you, we read that you're originally from Georgia and that you first studied writing and directing in college. So I'm just wondering, how did you first become interested in writing and how did that lead to pursuing acting? Uh, I, I've always been writing since I was a little kid. And I, I, I came from a very poor, you know, neighborhood for family. We were so poor, we couldn't afford the extra O and O. So, <laughs> so, so some, I think because we didn't have, I didn't have, I learned to dream and I learned to write from that. So I, I still remember the first thing I wrote when I was like six years old. It was wow. called the little, the little boat that couldn't float. Oh, I love it. Rhymes. The little boat. That, so how did that lead into pursuing acting? Because I was a fool. <laughs> <laughs> a talented fool. I don't know. I, you know, I, my grandmother I, and my mother, but mostly my grandmother, I used to see the pain on their face. And I've always wanted to make them smile. Sometimes I would do crazy things to make them smile. And my grandfather once told me that whenever you see someone that's not smiling, give them one of yours. Oh, and, oh my gosh. I've never cried during an interview, but I might now. Wow. That's, no, that's a great uh, Well, you got that Visine on the side. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> It's called well, soap proper tears. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just one big tear going down the chip. Yeah. No, wow, that's a great piece of advice. And so, so I also read, like, again, these are random, like IMDb type things, but wanted to check them with you that you studied under Marlon Brando. Is that true? Yes, Marlon Brando. When I first came here during his last days, he had something called a workshop called Lion for Living, and he wanted to test it out on. Actors. So I was one of those that got there that was a part of his workshop and he taught improv. And one of the great things about Marlon Brando, how he taught his class was that, um, like I said, lying for living. So he said that you have to become the character that you're doing. And we wasn't noticing what he was doing. So he said, I've always wondered what it would be like to play an English dame. And so he, the next day he had this scarf around his neck. The next day he had on little things. To the end of the day, the uh, uh, workshop, the days, he was dressed like an English woman and talked like one. So each day he showed us as he was doing it, but he never finished the last portion because he got ill. And so we never saw that. Wow. I mean, so talk about like transforming yourself to become a character. Yes. Wow. Sure. But that's so amazing that you got a chance to study under him. It's just such an amazing experience, I guess. You know, You know, um, when I came to Los Angeles, I can tell you when I came first came to Los Angeles, it was Friday the 13th in April 1979. It was rainy. I had one hundred and thirteen dollars in my pocket. Wow. This, this, this is no lie. And I think uh, I was late getting to the airport and everything. My brother was supposed to pick me up, but he did not. And I, I was late. So everything was the 13th. And we always been taught that 
the 13 was a bad number, you know, in the elevators, it doesn't, it skips the 13th floor. But then I was told that 13 was really a lucky number because in the last supper, Jesus was the 13th person. So I always said, okay, I really don't care what it is, but you know, but I remembered that day then. So when I got here, I got a job at Universal Studios well, one of the first people I met was the great late Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, wow. Jeez. So I came here when the last of the old great people was making their transition. I got a chance to meet Lucille Ball. I got a chance to meet Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, Taylor Savalas allowed me to take his workshop as well. Jack Cuckman, who was doing the show called Quitsy at Universal. When he found out that I was a young kid that was up here trying to make it, didn't have much money. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Quincy. That's probably too old for you all to remember. But it was a TV series. And so it was filming every day at Universal Studios. So he made sure that the caterer saved me a plate every day to eat. Wow. So I, I think the reason that I do what I do and why I do what I do, because in my life, I'm just going with my life, I've been given back to, I've been blessed. So it's my way of passing it on to you. I think I said before we started taping is that why I wanted to do this because of Mikey had explained to me who you were. And I told him I want to do it for one, it was Mother's Day. My mother taught me not to judge. My mother taught me that people are people and to respect and let God handle his business. We don't handle anything. If God got a problem, we let him handle it. But when I moved to California and I first got my job, and let me go back. In college, when I was in college and didn't have money, I had a cousin who was gay. And this cousin, I wasn't very kind to. I wasn't kind to him, nor was the so-called men in my family kind to. I wasn't mean, but I wasn't kind, put it that way. And so, but every month when I went to the P.O. box, there was $20 in there. I didn't know who the $20 was from. And then when I got my first series of papers with what's happening now, it was the opening day, you know, you invite your friends or your family. I didn't have family per se out here, but my best friend family was out here. And he asked me if I have anyone out here. And I told him that I did not. And he said, well, somebody was in the audience that was saying that it was your cousin. No, you name it, my cousin. So to make a long story short, is that my cousin Billy had flown out here and he has made his way to see me on stage. And he didn't want people to know who he was. He didn't want me to know that he was there because he was gay. And he thought that I would have been embarrassed of his presence and he didn't want to harm me. And it made me think about all that shit that I had did, my family had did, and then I had to look at it. The true people that supported me was the people that I didn't give the love to. Billy passed of age, and I didn't get a chance to thank him. But what I can do is say, I will carry his love and whatever I can, so when I, he asked me to be here. I'm here for my, because I want to be because of Billy and because I love everyone. Wow. Now, that's it. That's that my mother's day. So, geez, <laughs> thank okay. you so much. I mean, wow. That is a beautiful <laughs> I, I wanted story. To, I wanted to say that. So thank you. Seriously, yeah. thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for, wow. I, um, I'm a little speechless. I'm a little yeah. emotional. Um, that that's a beautiful story, and I think it's important. I think a lot of people, it, you know, life is a learning experience. Like we're we're not perfect people, and we learn things at, and we grow as people. I by no means am not um 
perfect. You know, well, Tim I, thinks I'm, he's perfect. I'm perfect. Tim thinks he's perfect. But, <laughs> um, but I think, you know, just, yeah, there's, it's, we, we talk to so many different people and we, you know, all these great experiences, they build us as people and build up our characters and just, um, you know, just thank you for sharing that with us, seriously. And um, that means a lot to hear. And I've we are never, so grateful. I, I've never shared it before. I'm wow. so glad you shared it with us. Seriously. I, I, I've never, I, I'm going to say on camera, I never shared it on camera before. And I, and it was something that Mikey said that made me say, nah, I can share it again. Thank you. Mm. Seriously, we are honored to have you share that with us. We are truly honored that you would share something like that with us, because obviously, you know, we're going to be talking about Nightmare on Elm Street and all the things that everyone <laughs> talked to you about. But, yeah, but, but but the, these really powerful stories, uh, you know, are what make us human. And I think that's great. And a lot of people see these stars as like just their favorite actors and the people in these movies. But we're all human beings and we all have these stories, too. So thank you for sharing that with us. Seriously. Wow, I'm trying to think. It's I like mean, I, I guess to shift gears a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, growing up, were you a fan of horror movies? Yeah. Were there any that made an impact on you? Like now that we've totally shifted. The the um horror movie that I I liked was The Birds. You know, oh, that was a great one. And then when I got older, in high school or mid uh, junior high school, I remember. There was this movie called Blackula. Yes. And, you know, and so, uh, and by the late, great William Marshall. Now, and I, I don't know if you know, but I am the first African-American or Black to survive an international major horror film and return to a sequel. We did but, see that. Yeah, we were going to actually talk about that. But yes, yeah, please. But the truth of the matter is, it was William Marshall from Blackula, but that was one of those black exploitation movies. So it, it didn't have the international fame like A Nightmare on Elm Street. So I, but that, those were the two movies that I liked. Um, and that's why I met Alfred Hitchcock. It was a circle. And I believe yeah. that life is a circle. Right? You know, you, you got that circle going. Mm -hmm. It's great. And um, so, okay, so you got to talk about the birds with Alfred Hitchcock? Yeah, did you get to? No, 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 no. It was it was oh. never a conversation where we got. See, I was a security guard. I, and one of the ways that they make sure you was doing your job, you had these little keys that you go around and you have to click here and then you got to go click there. But, you know, I, you know, being a sneaky person that I was, I would take a key off this week. The next week, Jake, another key off. So I would, I had 21 keys. So I would just sit down, watch TV. And just... <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind me asking, uh, you were a security guard at Universal? Universal Studios. Yeah. yeah, I was a security guard at Warner Brothers for 11 years. Y'all made more money than we did. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I think this is Tim's full I circle mean, moment. No, no I really, it was a good time. I had a great time <laughs> it, with it, my little bike and riding around and watching sitcoms being taped. I had a great time. What year was this? Uh, 2001 to 2012. Uh, <laughs> y'all had, y'all had, had 1979 to 1985. Y'all had unions then. Y'all had unions. I was only being paid $3.25 an hour. Oh, we, we did have the unions, yes, yes. Yeah, y'all got the unions. Y'all <laughs> got the unions. We didn't have the unions. And we, and Universal was the only studio that didn't have their own security guards. They hired security guards outside, which was Barnes International or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It but was, no, I didn't get a chance to talk to African Cop about anything. He just saw me. And looking at everything, and I jumped and he said, um, you don't have to run. Huh. <laughs> wow. And then he like, walked back to his office. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Just frozen and frozen. Yeah. And wow. then said, don't worry, I got keys to your place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so going on to Nightmare on Street 3, how was your, what was your audition like for that film? Yeah, we've heard it's a big because I've I read like there's a big story that's involving like rain and cussing out the director. Please tell us the whole story. You want me to tell the whole story? Oh, you know yes. What? You know, back then, that's when uh, the casting directors will set out something called the breakdown where they would want to uh, describe the character they're looking for. 
So my agent had called me and read me the breakdown and said he was looking for this role called Ken Cade. And he described him to me. And I said, that doesn't fit me. You know, I looked at myself. I ain't got no real fine body. I ain't got all that. And I had to go to court the next day. And I said, I got to go to court. And it was the one time that it was not raining at cats and dogs. I didn't have a car. So I went to court. I lost. And, you know, what I had to pay was literally half of my rent. And I didn't have the money. So I had to get on the bus. Didn't have an umbrella as well. And catch three buses to get to where the audition was. My plan was to go up there. Uh, by four or whatever the time was. I don't remember the time. I guess it was at, get up, get, get, it was 4.30. I would get there like at four, run up and do the audition, do the audition at 3.30 and be back on that 4.50 uh, bus to get back home. Yeah. When I got there, it was about an hour late. Oh, oh no. no. <laughs> it was an attitude. And all these guys had on these white beards showing their body. And I'm looking now, me and my, even if I held my stomach in, then I looked like I had a breast. So, you know, I went into the audition with an attitude, serious attitude. I was ready to go. You no, know, so he said, say what you would say. So I cussed him, you know. He I was cussing him actually. And then afterward, he just looked at me and he said, Thank you. So I went home. They thought I was playing with an attitude. I really had an attitude. I really didn't want to be there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I got home, you know, that's when those answer machines looked like a shoebox. And they were huge, yes. It was huge. And my agent had called about 30 sometime. Anyway, I finally picked up the phone and he said, what the hell did you do? I said, well, David, I told you I didn't want to go. And he said, they loved you. You got it. Oh my gosh. Now, were you excited? I mean, did you see parts one and two? I had never seen Nightmare on Elm Street. I what? didn't know what Nightmare on Elm Street was. They offered me the role. And then they had a lot of cussing in it, right? And so I had come from the church. I had come from a family who had church that they didn't know that I cursed like I cursed. I could cuss. <laughs> with such dignity but <laughs> and so i i um i called the pastor they told me not to do it everybody i called said don't do the role so i end up calling this lady i know a neighbor she was an elderly lady and she always read the bible there was not a place she kept the bible to the bathroom with her so um so i was talking to her she said well, wait a minute, baby. And she, you know, when she went to church, she had this white coconut hat on. Mother just <laughs> sat in this chair and sat in the same spot since she was a child. White gloves, everything. And stockings pulled up just below her knees with a big knot inside. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so she said, well, I said, it's this movie and they don't want me to do it. And the pastor told me I shouldn't do it. And she said, well, wait a minute, baby. Let me put my, put my Bible down there. So we can <laughs> of course. And so she put the Bible down and she said, well, baby, does it pay? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, fuck them. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so that's all you needed, right? You're right. like, I'm taking this. If the Bible lady can say fuck them, you can take this far. You didn't say fuck you. She said fuck them. Fuck them. Yeah. Fuck them. <laughs> so you get the script. Is she like, what are your initial thoughts of the script? Yeah. And did you go back and watch the first two movies? <laughs> no. I, I didn't. I, I, at the time, I didn't. I, you know, but everybody knew about the movie. When I was riding the bus, everybody knew what night me on Elm Street. And so, um, I, I can't, I, I don't remember anything. I know everybody was excited that I had the role. So when I got the script, you know, what we did at the time, you know, because, you know, black sheep get killed up front. So we just looked at the first three pages. And I kept looking through and I said, oh, this got to be a mistake. I called my agent, you sure I'm paying Ken Kate? You know, because originally Ken Kate was not for a black guy, it was for a white guy. And so I got to the end. He was still there. And I said, oh, shit, we're going to rewrite this. 
Oh, no. <laughs> well, did you ever get I had heard there were rumors about like an initial script that Wes Craven wrote that was like a lot darker and I guess may have killed off Joey and Kincaid. Did you ever hear about that or was the script? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know what it was. I know that I know that Kincaid, I was told by West is that um, Kincaid was originally a white guy. He wasn't a black guy. Mm-hmm. And so they decided to go that way. And so I'm grateful that they did, that he, he did. There were several writers on Nightmare on the Street. So, yeah. um, did you get to meet Wes? Was he around? I met him one time. Oh, my gosh. One time. And I didn't meet him during the shooting of Nightmare on the Street. I met him at a function that I went with with a friend of mine. And he was there. And I told when I went up to meet him, I said, I'm I know who you are, Ken. Say those Ken K blah blah. You did a great job. And that was it. Oh, well, but that's nice that you yeah. got to meet him. I didn't know if he like hung out on set at all because I know obviously he wasn't the director, but I know he had a lot to do with it, like the initial idea and stuff. I didn't meet him on set. I met yeah. him outside of the set. You know, so this film, speaking of the director, was um, Chuck Russell's directorial debut. And since then, he's gone on to direct like The Blob, The Mass, The Scorpion King. What was his directing style like? Do you have any memories of working with him? I, I, I credit Chuck Russell in making uh, Nightmare work because what Chuck Russell did is that prior before we had our first scenes and started shooting, he got all the nightmare kids together and we had a couple uh, uh, gathering like a good party. And we got to know each other. So one of the first, the first thing that I shot was the one with uh, Joey walking out like this here. Yeah. And the second scene was all of us together in that room that when I went off on and said, fuck you, you sit down. The group there, yeah. group, the group. Yeah. Group. Yeah. You know, I, I <laughs> that was the first I remember my lines. I didn't have to feed them, but you know, fuck it, you sit out still a little bit. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, so when we was on the set and we was filming that scene, we actually cared for each other. It wasn't a case that we was a new actors coming on, didn't know each other that day. We knew each other, so we had a kinship a friendship and we had brotherhood in that scene and what Chuck Russell did and for Nancy, Heather Landingham, that was the first day that I saw her. So when she walked in, that was real. Oh, wow. So because I had not seen, and I don't think you know, some of the others had seen her before and because I had not watched any of the other Nightmare on Elm Street movies, and I saw her, I, I, my reactions, I believe, was real. Um, so I think Chuck Russell should be given credit for bringing us together for that. That's really great. And, you know, we've heard about other movies where the director will try to get the cast to meet up beforehand to kind of build that camaraderie. Like on April Fool's Day, they all met together for like a month or a couple of weeks, I think. And I feel like that's so important because then you really believe that they're friends in the film, you know? I think that's important. But I think, see, in the old school days, they used to do that. And the actors like would want that. And I think we still do it. But you see... Now that SAG got involved in it, um, and they should, um, because that's what they're supposed to be there for, but sometimes it can be a little hurtful because we're not supposed to get together like that without pay. Oh, yeah. And I think some of the uh, directors would love to do that, but, you know, they don't want to get caught up with a irate actor saying, well, I'm going to be paid for this. They don't want to do all that. But me as a director, um, I talk to the actors to see if we can get together, you know, uh, speak with a great set where you know I'm doing my short film, right? We're going to talk about that, right? Yeah, of course. But you, no, you didn't. You were looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? Of course. <laughs> no, I'm saying, no, I'm saying, of course, we would like to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have invited me. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. Go on. 
No, but I think that's what happens um, with that. I think it's needed. Um, and I think we should, I think that when are we doing a film, I think they should say to the actors, you have at least free time to get together and work with the director if you, if you can and if you want to, not that it's mandatory. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good. I mean, point. with the long hours and like all the technical effects and everything, was there ever tension or anything on the set? Or, I, you know, I'm told that there was tension. I mean, you know, because you know, and when he did the uh, documentary, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it, it was talking about the tension, but I didn't see it. I, I let me take that back. The only time I saw there was some tension, I remember there was one day that there was a meeting call with the crew, everybody. And we was filming the um, scene, the hell, you know, we, I go down the hill, walk down the hill. And the one of the producers walked up to the top stair and he told everybody, the bullshit stops here. Okay. And I, I think there was a lot of stuff that was going on with the set. I didn't have that problem. I was I was not big on being social. It had nothing to do with anyone else. Um, it's because I wanted to write. I was a writer. So when I wasn't on the set, I was in there writing or studying my lines. And so uh, so I did not see a lot of the things that was probably going for on. the best. I was gonna say yeah. that's probably it seems for like the best. it's working out. Yeah, because yeah. then it does it didn't affect your um experience. So I've got to say, as someone who loves using expletives, I absolutely loved Kincaid because he spoke his mind and he just had some of the best lines in the film. And I have to give you my three favorites. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's go kick the motherfuckers ass all over dreamland. Uh, now it's my dick that's killing me. <laughs> and Freddie, where are you hide in your burnt face pussy? <laughs> and you, you want to know something? Yes. All those, all three of those lines was it they, they was slides that wasn't in the script oh so you improv them it was improv that's oh, amazing that's, that's what i was gonna ask because I, my question was gonna be were they in the script or did you get the improv but that's amazing because a lot of times you know you'll improv and maybe the director will use it or enough but they must have trusted you enough you know with the character I, I, as a writer myself i did try to stick back to them uh stick to them but when he said just come out and give it you know sometimes you have if you in the moment, I don't think Ken Sagos was saying the lines. Right. Ken Cade was saying the lines. Exactly. And so Ken Cade was doing his thing. You know, we, when we go out and we dance, we all have our own little moves that we do. You know, I got, you know, I, I, I I'm learning how to do a uh, grip walk. Hey, because I, I, <laughs> I saw Snoop Dogg. And I have, I, I, if I ever run into Snoop Dogg, you got to teach me the grip walk. <laughs> but, you know, truthfully, what I also love about Kincaid is that even though he has this kind of tough guy exterior, you know, you can also tell that underneath it all, he's just a guy that really cares about his fellow patients, you know, and I was just wondering, is that kind of how you interpreted the character, too, or did you see Kincaid differently? I saw him that way, but I also um, believe that on paper, he wasn't written with a lot of love and care. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things that I was taught that I always wanted to do is bring that inner self out of the character. I, I just remember a lot of times when I was in school, I hate to tell you so, when I was in school and people thought I was mean or being bad, it wasn't that. It was just that I was trying to make people see, not see how hurt I was about something. Like a so protective I, wall, right? Yeah, that protective wall. protective wall. Well, I mean, it really came through on screen with the character because, again, like you can see that he is a loving person who really does care about people. So that really came through in your performance, you know. Um, and I obviously in this film, there's a, a huge cast from you know Final Girl, Heather Langenkamp, and John Saxon. Obviously, Robert Anglin, Lawrence Fishburne, Oscar um, winner Patricia Arquette. Yeah. So, who did you feel like? Who did you get to know the most during filming? Do you have any stories from working with any of these co-stars? 
it, um, those is your name. Don't forget Lawrence oh. Fishburne. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah, but, um, yeah. They all was like big brothers or big sisters to us, you know. Especially Heather Landing Camp and Robert Ingram. Especially Heather, she was really big, and I got to know her. And it, it, even to this day, she's still the big sister. And so is Robert. But I got uh, uh, Patricia Arquette. I will always have a special love for her because I didn't have a car still then. And she brought me home when I lived in South Central. And she had a little uh, bug. And I remember one day she said, do you want to ride home? And I said, go where I live. She said, that's okay. And she drove all the way to South Central where I was living and took me home. Oh, wow. And I look back there and I said, I would have done that. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, you can and do it. But rush hour. <laughs> it, was <laughs> it was rush hour. It was. Oh. <laughs> but it was rush hour. It was rush hour. It, 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 I'm just saying, you know, I don't think that's what the casting people did when they hired us. But they actually hired a lot of talented people and not just talented people but a lot of good people yeah and you know so um and on and off the set so because you know again i go back i didn't see any of that but it was Lawrence fishburne that taught me how to do physical comedy in that brief little time when we was doing that psycho scene therapy scene it was yeah. not Oh, wow. Yeah, because he, it's funny because he is such a memorable character, Lawrence Fishburne, and sometimes people do gloss over because, you know, they're focused on Robert Englund or Heather Langenkamp, but there's a lot of stars in this film. There's just a ton of people yeah. who were in this film, and I think Robert Englund said something that everyone, there were so many cast members and crew members that had a crush on Patricia Arquette during filming. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, because Rodney and I was became very close and he was just fascinating with me. <laughs> Especially after that ride home during I rush mean... hour. No, I, I said Robert England, I mean, uh, Rodney Eastman was, yeah. you know. Uh, and, Head over heels. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and um, so were you around like... As a matter of fact, the best thing they gave him was a character that couldn't talk because I, he, I don't think he could have talked. He was so in love with us. Uh, wow. That's great. <laughs> so did you stick around when they were filming all the death scenes or did you just go to your trailer or did you wait to see it on the big screen? And did you have a favorite of all the death scenes? In three? In yeah. part three, yeah. Uh, it wasn't a death scene, but my favorite scene was the snake after coming after her, but the number one favorite scene is when he said, Welcome to Prime Time, bitch. Oh my god, I mean, <laughs> one of the best. <laughs> that you, you know, how can you not forget that? That was such so classy, so it was brilliant. It really wow. was. It's so it's, memorable. Yeah. I mean, not we still in, say it. We're not, we say it, and it's not even just a, across horror lovers. Like, I feel like anyone who knows film knows that line and just you know it's there's certain things that just stick out in your memory you know um were you were you happy with like oh. yeah the um i was just gonna ask oh, you ending. um were you happy i mean not happy but were you sad when nancy got killed at the end of the movie yeah were you how did you feel about that as someone who was in the film with her <laughs> like in the mirror yes. scene yes you know but <laughs> but you see in horror if there's sequels you you, you don't you don't Hold on to somebody getting killed. They can always come back. And this had things. This was about dreams. Yeah. So the fact that it was about dreams, we could always come back. They Absolutely. Bring you back. That's another thing. But yes, those were sad moments. Like I told you, um, Patricia Arquette, Rodney, and myself, you know, we had all become friends. Mm -hmm. And that was real to us. And we all was young up and coming talented young actors i believe they were a little more talented than i was but i was trying to hang in there well well you know what um yeah it was kind of a shock i think for people in the series to see that happen because people get attached to these characters yeah. you know but, but isn't that what make good film 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it definitely <laughs> raises the stakes. It definitely does a shock value. But like we still today, like hate it when the people we love get attached movies, to them, you get attached to them and then kill them off. And we will get to that for part four. With, but, with you, so but... when rap, when part three was all wrapped and done, was there like a red carpet premiere? Or like what was your experience like watching it on the big screen for the first time? It was at 20th Century Fox. They screened it at 20th Century Fox. It wasn't no red carpet type thing. It was just like a big screening. And we went there. And when I got there, um, I remember the director of photography said something. He said, have y'all told him what's going on with him? Because I guess at that time they had did a survey and Ken K. character was like off the chain. It was Ooh, really nice. you tested. It's like That's, a test screening. You of did course, great. yeah. So, uh, but you know, I didn't say anything because I was still nervous about it. I was still very nervous about it. But I think everybody, they loved everybody because it, you see, Nightmare 3 had everything in it. It had old school type directing, it had some of the old actors in there, it had things about uh, unity in there, it had things about drugs in there, it had mental health in there, it had everything in there. I think that's what made it so powerful and so popular. By the way, where are you all? Are you all in, because you said something about Warner Brothers, where you all live? Oh, Los Angeles. Yeah. So why couldn't we have just gotten together and did this in person? Oh, I mean, I, we would have loved to. We didn't even think that was an option. Are we, you kidding? We just did this we, because of the pandemic. We, we <laughs> wanted it to be as easy as possible, but are you kidding? It would have made our day to do this in person. Yeah. Did this in person, you know? Yeah. Oh well, I blame Mikey. Yeah, <laughs> that's getting. Well, we could have given you a third mic. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we would have loved you. We've been doing, uh, we've been doing this podcast for about a year and a half. We started um over the pandemic, so all of our interviews have been over Zoom, and I think we've just gotten so attached to it that we haven't even thought about doing in person. I only asked because he said he worked at Warner Brothers. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I live in West Hollywood. Cliche, cliche. I know, I know. Like, uh, <laughs> well, you know, so, okay, so you, Joey, and uh, Kristen survive part three, and then one year later, they're going to make Nightmare on Elm Street part four, the Dream Master. I'm wondering how soon after part three finish did you find out they were making a sequel and did they always intend to bring the three survivors back? I, I don't know. I, I know that I didn't find out right away. I actually didn't find out until maybe about a month or two when they were getting ready to shoot part four. And as a matter of fact, they had my character in the breakdown for recasting. What? And, um, so I don't know if that was there. You know, they, they play games like that. They, uh, you know, it was in the breakdown, but Rodney was in the breakdown too um, for casting, you know. So I don't know if it was a mistake or not. And sometimes they do stuff like that to send a message to the actors don't start no shit. <laughs> 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 but, um, but it was also at a time when we auditioned. When it was doing for, it was at a time where uh, uh, the writers was on strike. Yeah, I remember. Okay. The, I mean, I I remember reading about the strike. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I so was we, 10. we didn't we didn't have a script. It was all like in treatment type stuff, and they was talking about what was going to happen. So they didn't have a script uh, during that time. So I don't know what happened. So when, time, when did you initially find out that that your role was getting killed? Yeah, that you were his first victim. When did you find I, out it, and how did you feel? <laughs> oh, oh, God, it was, you know. I mean, it's really your dog's fault. <laughs> <laughs> his name was Jason, by the way. Yeah, exactly, Jason. his name was Jason. <laughs> his name was Jason. Yeah, but I mean, um, I, I'm just trying to imagine what you were thinking after getting through all of part three, this great experience, and then you find out you're the first victim. What, what were you thinking? No more chicks. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just said, damn. <laughs> I, I just did three or four pages and all I remember seeing was tell him Freddy's at you <laughs> and that was like on page eight. I said, damn. <laughs> I just I mean personally though, like do you feel like it but was I believe right to say this I, I believe that if Patricia or Kit had 
returned, I probably we probably would have been on there a little bit longer because she had become a big star, bigger than what she was at the time. And so I think they wanted to get rid of the old and bring in the new. Yeah, I just, though, as a fan, like we've talked about this with other people in horror movies who survive and then are killed off. And to be honest, we hate it. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we we're not it. fans. Well, we, we like the we, old school. We had gotten attached to these characters in part three. And, you know, after surviving and enduring, you know, such that, you know, such an experience like that, it just sucks to see them kind of disposed of. I mean, personally, do you feel like it was a smart decision for them to do that because it kind of raised the stakes? Or do you think it was a mistake to get rid of the survivors? To get rid of me? Or you took our, all three of the survivors from part three. Of course, I'm going to say it's a mistake to get rid of me. <laughs> A natural response. I ain't got. What about the survivor? Let's talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> You're like as long as Kincaid makes it. Um, um, I'm gonna tell you from a writer's point of view. I understand what he was doing. Uh, but I was told. And I don't have any proof about it, but I was told by a reliable source that Kincaid was supposed to come back. That's why he said, "I'll see you in hell." Oh. That, that they wanted to do a confrontation between Freddy Krueger and Ken K. But do I, but do I ever see that on paper? No, I did not. Now, I also know there was a part six where the Dream Warriors came back. All the Dream Warriors came back. There is a script that's out there where all the Dream Warriors came back. Wow. Uh, but they didn't do that. They went on to something else. 3D. <laughs> well, no, I mean, what well, that would have been great. I mean, yeah. Dream Wars is one of like the everyone oh gosh, loves everyone's that one. Favorite. And I, I, so you know, you were speaking about the kind of the friendship that you um, built with um, Patricia Arquette and um, Rodney on the part three. And then I know in the Never Sleep Again documentary, you kind of mentioned that it wasn't the same because Patricia Arquette didn't come back. I know Tuesday night took over the role and you didn't kind of have the same camaraderie. Do you think that was just because you just didn't have the same amount of screen time to build that friendship? Let me clear that up. I didn't say that. Oh, you didn't? I did. What I said was, is that Patricia, is that Patricia Arquette did a wonderful job and Tuesday night came in and she should be commend commended for what she did. And she did a fabulous job because I got to know Patricia Arquette and then I got to know Tuesday night. Yeah. And it was Tuesday night that I believe that had the most difficult job of the dream ones because, uh, Patricia Arquette had did a fabulous job mm -hmm. as, you know, Kristen. And then Tuesday night, who was the first to come to me and Rodney and welcome us to folk. And she had to come in and take over a role that had been magnificent by uh, 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 Patricia Arquette. And she did it. One minute, the first thing we shot the Tuesday night was at that locker room that locker closing the locker one minute after tuesday night opened her mouth i no longer thought about Kristen. Oh. she took that role and she owned it yeah. and and she did a fabulous job at the end and Kristen and uh, patricia arquette did a fabulous job at the beginning that's what I said. And I know at one time they cut a lot of stuff out and made it look like I did not care about you tonight. That's bullshit. So that's why I'm taping this interview. So and I want to know where you live so I can come see you. Uh. If you <laughs> no, I'm, I am glad that you cleared that up because they did make it. They did cut it in a way where yeah. it looked like you did, yeah. didn't have the same camaraderie. We love Tuesday night. We. We had her on the podcast. She was just absolutely amazing. And yeah. I can't even imagine taking over an established role and how difficult that was. That's so. the most, that was the most difficult role. And she made me, and I believe I'm speaking for Rodney as well. She made me feel comfortable on there, um, that role. She came to my dressing room and knocked on the door and said, hi, I'm Tuesday night. And so the three of us 
walked into the set together. Oh, and wow. That was because of Christian uh, uh, Tuesday night. So that's why I'm very serious about here because it they cut to get ratings, but don't cut to mess up what I said. Yeah, that's so weird. I mean, I don't remember any of that in the documentary. No. I wonder why it they was, didn't. It, it was all cut out. It was all cut out. Well, it, thank you for clearing that up here. And especially because, yeah, I mean, like it, you, it, it's I, like I said, I can't even imagine having to come in to take over a role when there's already people that had acted with the previous and, person. And, and, you know, one other reason is because, and I feel bad because uh, when Kristen, when Tuesday night started, it appeared that I felt that way. And you know, and you when you do that press, when you do stuff like this here, you hurt people relationships. Our relationship is solid. Let's understand it. Awesome. But you know, but for a minute there, she felt that I did, I did not care for that. That was not true. Mm-hmm. Don't take this here out of this here interview. Oh, not true. We will, we'll we will not. And like I said, we love Tuesday, but she was one of our I, first I know interviews. Where you, live. you know where I live. We're cut you're cut. You're coming to get us, you know. Man, um, LA. Man, <laughs> LA. You're a bus ride. That's right. <laughs> so what was it like filming your death scene? Like, were you in an actual junkyard or were you on an, like a soundstage? It was actually in, in junkyard. It was in North Hollywood. It was that junkyard. They went out there and I think it took them a month or so to build a junkyard. Um And it was done really, really well. It looks beautiful on screen. Yeah. It's screen. And it took us a week to film that, you know. Really? It took us a week to do that. And, you know, and it was, uh, I remember the last day, it was that it was cold. It was really cold as hell, you know. And we were shooting all night. And I remember Robert and I was joking because when we killed me, it was smacking. It was emotional because that was my last day. And Robert is, Robert is such a jokester. He like held that razor up in me for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but what they had did is that, you know, like went in and they had leveled me down. I think it was something like with a steel stomach or something. And then it was another one over that. So when he stuck the razors in there it went between here so it wasn't touching my skin oh wow that's good <laughs> yeah so in these, the actual razors were near your body no no they was they wasn't i was covered i was protected. oh got it okay it yeah. wasn't they're like they're putting people at risk <laughs> i think there was three different there's three different razors i believe there's the real sharp ones but someone is always there with that one and then there's the plastic ones and then there's the other ones but the razor that i had that he was using with me was not the real sharp ones okay and that was many times after he finished i think that they would come and chain razors so that that's what that was no i was never in harm they had several people on there as a matter of fact let me take some help you with something else when i jumped from that top car mm-hmm. i jumped two feet they brought in a stunt man to do the rest. Oh, uh, that's I nice. Didn't that. <laughs> I didn't know that either. Yeah. Even the dog had a stunt up. Little that was, Jason. They, that was the most arrogant ass dog I had ever met. That's funny. That dog, you know that that dog just walked around because he knew he was the shit. And then he had this little mutt over there that looked like it. He did all the well, head I mean, he, he had the power to bring Freddie yeah, back. Yeah, I was going to say, he, knew, he knew he was very um, powerful with that pee. You know, I, you know, I, you know, where were you when it was cold in the house? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted to ask you about, because the, the, obviously part four had a different director. Um, this time it was the the free-spirited Rennie Harlan. I'm just wondering what Rennie was like to work with and how did his style differ from Chuck's style from part three? Uh, Rennie was great too. Rennie had his own style, but we, was, uh, we wasn't on the set long enough for me to be embraced with Rennie like I was embraced with Chuck. Chuck, you know, he had a lot of freedom at the time. And because I believe, I believe because the script had was written for a white actor and I was a black actor, they let me do a little leeway to make it a little, you know, soulful in there. Um, 
by the time it got to Rennie, it was developed. So he just, I just had to go with it. They, the writers knew kind of like how to write for Ken K and not develop Ken K. Yeah. So, you know, and, but he was very good, very uh, giving us the moments as well. That's great. We we want to play just a quick little game with you right now. We're going to ask you some questions and you what? simply have to respond with either Nightmare 3 or Nightmare 4. Or you That's, could just say 3 or 4. Yeah, no, I want to hear Nightmare. Oh, Matt, <laughs> either, too much. Either Nightmare 3 or Nightmare 4. Some of them are just to kind of pit the films up against each other, get your ideas, and some are going to test your knowledge. You ready? Okay. 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 So jumping right into it. And honest opinion, which do you think is the better sequel? Nightmare 3. Cool. On which film did you have a better overall experience? Nightmare 3. Which have you seen more times throughout your life? Neither. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> which, which had more drama on set during filming? Nightmare 10. <laughs> which do you think had better death scenes in it that's a tricky one <laughs> nightmare three hmm. which had more behind the scenes romances <laughs> nightmare three really oh okay <laughs> now that i know of that you know no no hey which made more money in the box office oh nightmare three Actually, I, unless I read this, I know you want to say four. Let me <laughs> explain. Okay. Let me explain. <laughs> because of the money and what it costs to shoot the film <laughs> and the money they made, yeah. Nightmare 3. Well, who gives a fuck? I was in both of them. <laughs> that is true. That's a really good. That's answer. a great answer. Yeah. Uh, which was a higher body count? Which had? A... Oh, which had? What did I say? Which was? <laughs> Whatever. Which had a higher body count? What do you mean? Meaning more people got killed in it. Oh wow! You see, you, you asked me that how many times do I watch it? I haven't watched. Uh, I think I think you're gonna be fine if you guess either. You know why? Wow. It's a tie. It's a tie. We looked this up. It's a tie. Six people get killed in both films. Yeah, it's a random thing. W okay, and I know you're going to know. In which film do you say the famous line, Lifestyles of the Rich and Psychotic? Nightmare 4. Let's fucking with you three. Oh, I was going to say, <laughs> wait a second, wait a second. Oh, and then. Oh, okay, uh, which film featured the Freddy one-liner, How's This for a Wet Dream? Nightmare 4. Yes, Yay. during Joey's death scene. See, for even though you said you haven't seen them that much, you you know a lot about these films. You know, I I just um, you know, as we're kind of wrapping up, I wanted to just talk about like when do you think you first became aware of all the fandom behind the Nightmare on Elm Street series? Like, did you ever think these movies would become such a big part of your life, even thirty plus years I later? Did. I, I didn't. You know, when I you want to know what I actually thought Nightmare on Elm Street when I knew Nightmare on Elm Street had changed something in me. I was in the airport. I was in the bathroom sitting on the stool when somebody rushed in there and pushing a piece of paper under there and a pen and said, man, my flight back to leave. Can I get your autograph? And I said, not now. <laughs> so That's I said, amazing. Oh. <laughs> And then um, do you go to, I mean, okay. I know you attend some, but do you attend many horror conventions? And what's the most common thing people ask you? Or do they ask you to sign a certain, like, line? They ask me to say a certain line. Which line? <laughs> uh, the most popular line is, nasty my dick killing me and <laughs> fucking A. I love it. I Good love ones. it. Great lines. And and then you know we. Also, I did not understand fucking eight. I me. you know what me neither. But I, I mean I, that's what I learned from a nightmare on the street. Yeah. <laughs> I, so me and Chuck had a discussion about that. I'm saying I don't get this here. You know I thought it was like fucking ass. Why would I want to do that? You know. Oh, <laughs> you know, um, but I uh, but it became it has become one of the most most popular thing that I write when I'm signing. As far as the many uh. The um, conventions that I do, 90% of my funds goes to a my nonprofit giving back cooperation. 
for which I like to send kids to uh, pay for kids' books when they go to college. But I got a new mission that I'm going to do, two new missions. And one of them is that I want to be able to give a book in a, and supply scholarship to every historical Black college at the same time. And the other thing is, is that I want to send 50 kids to camp, one from each state. That's wow. incredible. And you know what? We had it down to ask you about the Giving Back Foundation because I know you founded this, I think, in the 90s. And, and 97, 97. Wow. And yes, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about it if you want to say anything more than you just said, because it's such a great foundation. Well, it, it, it's because, you know, like I said in the beginning of the interview that we, I, we did not come from a family with money, but we was rich in spirit and stuff like this here. And so many times when I did move to Atlanta and I would see during the summer there was kids going to camp and my mother could not afford to send me to camp. So, so many times I saw that bus driving off with a load of kids and some of my friends and I would pretend that I didn't want to go, but deep down I know that we could not afford for me to go. So, um, and then when I went to college, um, it was a lady that sacrificed for me to have my books, money to pay for my books. And when I was in college, I could not pay for my books. Um, so I promised God that if I ever got to a certain level, I was going to give back like it, things had been given back to me. So every year I try to send, I pay for some kids. When they go to college, I pay for those books and I send some kids to some account. That's what I choose to do. And that's what I will continue to do. That's, that's so awesome. That's amazing. I loved my camp experience. Granted, it was choir camp. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, but, <laughs> that, that's really amazing. Seriously, Ken, like that is such a great way of giving back. And, we and really I, really so far, I, so far, I've, I've, I've sent, I don't know how many kids to camp, but I do know that I have help put over 660 kids to college. Wow. wow. That's incredible. Seriously. And then also we wanted to give you a chance. You had mentioned that you're working on a short film. Can you tell us about that? I'm working on a short film. It's called The Secret Weapon. Yesterday is today. And it's about the children in 1963. Most people are not aware that it was children that gave the power back to the civil rights movement. So I wrote this short film in order to parlay it into a feature film. And it's about which, who I call the first Freddy Krueger. Oh. And it's about these children who went head to head with Eugene Boa Connor. Look him up. And he was a man that terrorized the city and terrorized the children. And he put them in jail with so many kids that came together and went against this man and that he, after the jails was four, he put them in hog pens, he put them in the fairground pens and they defeated him because of these children that gave the power back to the civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement is responsible for the rights that you all have, for the rights that women have, for the rights that minorities have. And it was these children that gave the pass back. That sounds incredible. It's such, that's such a great, um, powerful film to make. And wow, you know, that, that's great. We would love to keep up with that and see. So you said you're, you're in post-production. Yeah, don't worry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get your email so I can send you that GoFundMe. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that is great. Seriously, keep us posted on everything. And, you know, we um, just to wrap things up, we have one final question for you where we ask this to everyone we interview and it'll kind of put you on the spot a little bit, but it's a fun question. Um, what is one thing that you can tell us about your experience working on either Nightmare 3 or Nightmare 4 that you've never told any other interviewer or at any convention or any podcast or anything? Just one thing that you've never told before. It, it doesn't have to be scandalous. It, it, anything. It could it be could small, be like... it could be big, but um, anything, but something you've never told any other interviewer about your experience working on either of the two nightmares. I told you in the beginning, didn't I? Oh, the, the experience. Well, yes. Yeah, I mean, that actually, that's that, perfect. I mean, no, you're right. That that actually yeah. works. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you want me to tell you something now? Oh, of course. If you want to. <laughs> nope. It's optional. 
we got to finish this interview because I got to go to the bathroom. Ah, that's good. I think that could. You didn't see that coming, did you? Know, we did, didn't see that coming. That's great. No, you did give us a really good fact at the beginning, so that can count. Thank you so much. I just gave you another one. That you have to, <laughs> that you have to film about the short film, or that you have to go to the bathroom. Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> Beautiful. That's amazing. We made this our been, seriously, Ken. This has been so much fun, and we th- tell not, everybody that. No, we, oh, wait. What? Sometimes we have a horrible time. Seriously, but to be completely <laughs> honest with you, this has been not just entertaining, but moving and like powerful. And this has really been an incredible interview. Yes, so thank, thank you, you so for much. Being so open and honest with us. If we do this again, the next one, I would do it only in one condition. That we do it in person. Good yeah, uh, I would be, love we, we it would be we, our honor to meet you seriously forever. It would be our honor. It would be our honor and our pleasure. But thank you for taking the time. It really means so much to us. Thank, thank you. you. You're awesome. OK, thank you. take yeah, care. Hi. OK, Definitely. take care. Bye. Bye bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Happy Horror Time. This podcast is hosted by Matt Emmer and myself, Tim Murdoch, and co-produced and edited by Jacob Randall. We now release episodes every Monday, and in each episode, we either review horror movies that just came out or interview stars and insiders from iconic horror films. You can stream all our episodes directly from our website, that's happyhorrortime.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember... Our reviews do contain spoilers, so we always post the movies we're discussing a few days in advance on our social media pages, so listeners can check them out ahead of time. And speaking of social media, make sure you follow our pages on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Happy Horror Time. We even started putting our interviews up on YouTube along with our horror short film, Come In. You've got to check it out. You can find us on YouTube by searching for Happy Horror Time. If you'd like to support the podcast, please sign up to be a patron at patreon.com slash happy horror time. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash happy horror time. Patrons get access to our growing library of monthly bonus episodes and other fun benefits like ad free episodes that are out a day in advance, our monthly newsletter, participation in polls, and autographed Happy Horror Time stickers! Woo! And if you'd like to contact us, please send us an email at happyhorrortime at gmail.com. Tell us what you love, how sexy you think we are, whatever! I'm Matt Emmert. And I'm Tim Murdoch. And, and we, we hope, hope you have, have a happy, happy horror time! time.